so welcome to the second session of our new series which is the live series and it is called learnings from the medical legal cases so we designed this series so that whatever view finally whatever view is taken by the highest courts in the country regarding the issues which are which happen essentially in the hospitals and the uh, the concerned parties land up in court so that view becomes the final view as to how a particular situation should be viewed and how a particular implementation or a guideline or a, uh, an issue must be addressed so in that sense these become the case laws now it is important for us to see these cases because see these cases and also the orders that have been passed by the honorable supreme court and the national commission because this becomes the final uh, interpretation of the issue involved and that is why it is important for us to know these so with, uh, with this view we have started this series and we have already had one uh, session uh, which was on professional negligence uh, the series has received a wonderful response a lot of people have joined from Uh, they have they have registered and now they are also joining. Uh, and this uh, this particular today's topic will be taken by Colonel Ashish Banerjee. He is a doctor and also a lawyer. Lawyer in that sense that he has is qualified, but obviously in India you can't uh, you can't be registered simultaneously with the Medical Council and the Bar Council. So therefore he is a doctor with a very very nice and clear understanding of. how a medical legal case should be interpreted and he is here uh, with us to tell us the uh, the not only the case but also the interpretation of the court order another thing that we need to know is also how to prevent such an occurrence from happening in our own, hosp own hospitals so to that end i'll request the participants to ask questions whenever uh, towards the end of this program so that we get clarity the purpose of this program is to get clarity and to be able to function in such a manner that we are not drawn into medical legal uh, cases in that sense so i'll now hand over to colonel ashish banerji uh, over to him ashish your call thank you so much sir uh, good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, today's uh, index case is uh, mrs uh, miss samira kohli versus uh, dr prabha manchanda and another obviously uh, today's discussion is delimited uh, by the consideration that whether and how a doctor should secure and obtain consent before doing a treatment which includes includes a surgical treatment also we will consider that what actually shapes the boundaries of the consent in terms of duty of a doctor as to how much to disclose in this particular case uh, the irony is a bona fide operation was performed the operation was performed well but it was contested on two different grounds altogether as the surgeon the gynecologist and the obstet obstetrician has probably gone out of the boundaries for which a consent has been obtained and hence the case so we shall cover our presentation on these heads today coming to the facts of the case the patient is unmarried 44 year old lady at that time came to the hospital of the respondents with complaints of dysfunctional uterine bleeding on 9th may 1995 now at this stage before we go further for our best understanding i would uh, just state uh, uh, the parties to the particular suit or particular the court particular case obviously the case citation was taken from supreme court so it was an appeal now the appeal generated or the appeal transpired by Ms. Samira Kohli, who was the aggrieved party, as the matter was first litigated before a learned NCDRC, and the matter was rejected. While 
the matter was dismissed by NCDRC, agreed by the same. Ms. Samira Kohli appealed before the Supreme Court. So, what we are discussing when you talk about appellate, the appellant, appellant is Mrs. Ms. Samira Kohli, and the respondents are Dr. Prabha Manchanda and the husband. With that basic understanding, let's now go ahead with the case. In this particular case, once she reported to the hospital with complaints of a bleeding, painful bleeding, serious, severe bleeding, that is menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea, over a period of 9 to 10 days, a consent was obtained on 9th May 1995 for diagnostic and operative laparoscopy. And the consent read, that the laparotomy may be needed. During uh, the procedure, at the time when diagnostic laparoscopy was carried out, they found that it was a case of a frozen pelvis. And because of the adhesions, no organ in the pelvic cavity could be identified. So they extended the operation as was given in the consent and uh, operative laparoscopy was undertaken. At this juncture, they realized before uh, the procedure took place, an ultrasound was done. And during ultrasound, they had found there's some swelling on the right side of the pelvic cavity, uh, certain cysts, some fluid in the pouch of Douglas and cul de sac, and similar such findings indicative of endometriosis. But when a laparoscopy, an operative laparoscopy was performed, they found there was a huge mass of chocolate cyst that was sitting and as a result, the entire right side of the uterus, the fallopian tube, the ovary and some portion of the bladder, uh, bowel viscous is also getting adhered. On the left side, uh, the ovary was intact. However, the tube was uh, stuck in an endometriotic tissue and there was a small cyst as well. And there was a lot of blood in the pelvic cavity. With this finding, video recording was done and consent was obtained from the mother of the appellant, that is Samira Kohli, while she was under anesthesia, under GA, and an abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy was performed. The patient recovered and on 14th, May 1995, she was informed that her reproductive organs had to be removed because of the condition called endometriosis and that she should not have any further complication, it was removed. However, her suitor, uh, she has a, uh, had a boyfriend, Commander Jutsi, arrived in the hospital on 15th, uh, five, 15th May 1995. He was aghast that the consent was not taken and the patient was operated upon. They were planning to get married. So she was, according to him, an unwanted, an unwarranted and unauthorized illegal operation was carried out on her. This has robbed her of her chances of motherhood. This has diminished her prospects of marriage. This has caused him, caused her Lot of, lot of pain, agony and mental harassment. With all this, he incited the patient, instigated rather the patient and they, without settling the bill, moved out of the hospital. As a result, respondents lodged complaint on 23rd May 1995. And the allegation against the allegation of unauthorized removal of reproductive organs. A legal notice was served. A reply to the legal notice was given by the appellant, that is Samira Kohli, and a rejoinder was also filed. Once the pleading was complete, the appellant raised the issue with National Commission and filed a OA, original application. The matter was decided against them on 19 November 2003, the basic reason why learned NCDRC gave a dismissed the OA was three folds. 
Firstly, the appellants, as per NCDRC, voluntarily visited the respondent's hospital. The operation that was carried out, that is hysterectomy and other surgical procedures were done with adequate care and caution. There was no negligence in that. And that, that removal of uterus and ovaries was necessitated as the National Commission felt that the right to choose what type of treatment to be given has to vest with the doctor. The doctor must be free to decide what line of treatment they would take. And since there was no uh, allegation against wrong procedure that was adopted, the NCDRC dismissed the petition that, is, that was before them. Now, actually, how the matter unfolded, we shall discuss it from appellant's point of view, that's the patient's point of view, and then the respondent's point of view. We'll take one after the other. The appellants stated that at the time when ultrasound was done, no provisional diagnosis of endometriosis was made. They were stated that a tube would be inserted in the abdomen and just the abdominal viscous would be inspected for confirmatory diagnosis and it would not uh, cost more than 8,000 or 9,000 rupees at that time. Thereafter, another allegation that the patients had was that no informed consent, no information as to what type of operation the patient would be expecting, what would be the outcome, and in the eventuality of any failure, what would be done? And would she have any alternative way of dealing with it or not? Whether conservative methods would be approached, would be uh, employed, or some radical operation would be carried out. Nothing was discussed at all. Consent was obtained. And in the operation table, when she was unconscious, the assistant of the of Dr. Prabha Manchanda rushed out of the OT and showed a video to the elderly mother of the patient, showing that she is in a pool of blood and there is an emergency, an abdominal uh, emergency abdominal hysterectomy has to be carried out. And thereafter, consent was taken on a blank form. Also, they accused that she was, even after regaining consciousness, she was not informed about that such a radical operation was taken up, taken, uh, has, has taken place and her vital organs have been removed. It was actually respondent's son casually mentioned to them. And thereafter, when the doctor was questioned, she rudely shrugged it off, saying that you are already 44 years old and don't have any chance of fecundity. And therefore, no wrong has been done. Nothing great that has been done by removing the uterus and the ovaries. Now, the respondents took a different view. They stated when appellant came to their hospital, she wanted a permanent cure. She said she is having heavy bleeding and this is for a long time that she is having it. And as ultrasound would be obviously not uh, the right choice for investigation, it would, cannot uh, take you to a def definitive diagnosis. A laparoscopy was done. Wherein during the laparoscopy, it was found that there was a massive ovarian cyst, right side more than the left, with adnexal mass and uterus, various fallopian tube, and the ovaries were getting attached. There are chances of widespreading of this endometriotic tissues, resulting in spreading it to the nearby bowel, viscous, causing it perforation. As such, there were a lot of blood in the Ouch of Douglas, and also that the patient was almost at the perimenopoietic state. The chances of having further family can easily be ruled out. A hysterectomy was performed at the best interest of the patient as she herself wanted a permanent cure. Based on this, and as uh, they did not, the patient did not pay the money, they claimed an amount of around 40,000 rupees to be levied to them. Whereas patients had, in terms of compensation, claimed 28 lakhs in the consumer form. Now, what did the patient had in their mind when they go to the court? 
they stuck to that the consent taken was violated the operation was done which was not within the ambit of the consent they said the consent was for diagnostic and operative laparoscopy and a laparotomy may be needed whereas a completely different operation wherein all the reproductive organs were removed which was undertaken and not being within the ambit of the consent therefore it results both in assault as well as battery nowhere it was mentioned that there were extensive endometriosis it is neither mentioned to the patient orally nor it is written down in any of the documents case sheets the emergency operation was not stated anywhere hospital made a cooked up story to earn more money to charge the patient more and on two facets they came before the consumer court stating that the doctor and the hospital erred in two basic on two basic premises first that the surgery was beyond consent there was no consent for such radical surgery and second as discussed during that ultrasound that no conservative method was explored by the doctors they directly had gone for a radical abdominal total hysterectomy with salpingo oophorectomy bilateral this was the very basic premise with which the patient came to the court against which the doctors contended that the ultrasound abdomen is obviously by any means is not adequate for diagnosis of endometriosis laparoscopy was inconclusive because of the frozen pelvis situation bilateral chocolate cyst detected in operative laparoscopy laparotomy and there were severe adhesions all over the abdomen on site consent was indeed taken for the abdominal hysterectomy so it is not that the operation was against the consent patient was informed during morning round and she was completely satisfied with the whole operation and was very happy that she has been now cured of the problem that is recurring every month to her however the matter took a bitter turn once commander jutsi came and then patient was taken away without without permission bills were not paid and thereby the doctors had no role to play in the situation the issues that were brought before the court were following firstly the court wanted to decide whether informed consent was necessary for surgical procedure involving removal of reproductive organs and if that is so what is the nature of consent here the consumer court gave a clean chit to the doctors stating that whether a surgery would be extended or what type of surgery would be performed would have to be left to the specialist concerned and this cannot be determined by the patient individual patient also the fact that a on site consent was taken therefore the operation was not beyond the scope of the consent however when the matter was discussed in supreme court or agitated before the supreme court the question came whether informed consent was necessary for a surgical in uh, surgical procedure involving removal of reproductive organ answer was obviously yes the question was whether a specific consent would be required and once a consent given for diagnostic surgery can it be construed as consent for performing additional or further surgical procedure the matter was decided when number of experts were examined by honorable supreme from the appellant side dr puneet bedi a gynecologist and obstetrician who had been treating ms samira kohli for a long and had put her through hrt and other treatments 
was examined by the appellants themselves. Whereas from the respondent side, Dr. Sudha Saldhana, who was a president of Association of Obstetrics and Gynecology at that time and professor of obstetrics and gynecology herself, was also examined by the respondents. Now the question was decided whether laparoscopy and laparotomy includes hysterectomy within its definition. The respondent said, yes, laparotomy has to be done if abdominal hysterectomy has to be done. Therefore, laparotomy is a part of final operation and therefore abdominal hysterectomy is inclusive in laparotomy. This was clearly refuted by the appellants and their expert witness and also agreed by Supreme Court after going through a lot of literatures, which clearly stated that laparoscopy and operative laparotomy merely means opening up the, of the abdomen and examining the abdominal viscous for confirming the diagnosis or the pathology. So therefore, at that point in time, it was clear that an operation was conducted without due consent for the same by the respondents. Third question that came before <coughs> the court was, whether the consent by appellant for abdominal hysterectomy was performed by respondents? The answer to that was, the appellants, the question was not whether the operation that was performed was performed correctly or not. Not that the process of operation is under challenge, but the challenge is whether this process has been consented by the patient or not. Obviously, as an answer to this question appeared that the consent for this particular procedure, that is abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingiophorectomy was never taken. Now, the question that was before the court was that, is it an excuse for the doctors or is it an acceptable reply that the patient ultimately would have had to undergo such an operation, such a radical operation? Or more time and expenses and pain could have been saved. A patient was cured. However, through catena of judgments in India as well as abroad, it states that these are no excuses for the doctor to go beyond the realm of a consent that has been taken in black and white. Another point that was raised by the appellants was that the respondents falsely invented the case to take money from the patient. They supported their claim that ultrasound did not reveal endometriosis. However, again, various experts deposed before the court and said that ultrasound is not appropriate investigation to determine endometriosis. The videograph taken during the operation clearly showed endometritic tissue and therefore this particular point of appellates did not cut much, much ice in the court of law. The question where whether respondent ought to have resorted to conservative surgery or not was another point of contention. When contacted the respondent defended themselves saying that there was an emergency. However, during checking of the documents, the PARAP notes, as well as discharge mode, nowhere it is stated that there was an actual emergency in the operation theory. And why should the emergency have occurred? Lata Rengan, Dr. Lata Rengan, who was assisting <coughs> the respondent number one, that is Prabha Manchanda, she had clearly stated that seeing the frozen pelvis condition, it was decided that hysterectomy would be needed to cure this case. Therefore, there was no emergency. It is an established principle of law that if anybody has not consented for a particular procedure or has not consented to be touched intentionally, these amounts to battery as well as assault in tort. So therefore, as there was no emergency as taken as a shield by the respondents 
and the operation was conducted merely on a decision that this would be the best line of treatment for the patient as there was no emergency consent taken on a particular form of particular process of treatment was definitely violated that is what supreme court observed and noticed now the question of whether the respondent is guilty of any tortious act of negligence battery many issues were seen by the court the court first took up what is consent consent gives a person or a doctor the right to deal with the patient in a particular way the court held that a person cannot be stated to have actually consented if he has not been shown or given the opportunity to freely choose the option here the honorable supreme court went back to a very old case of 1914 in which justice cardozo in a case titled schwindroff versus society of new york hospitals had stated that every hum adult human being of mentally sound uh, immuno has a right to decide what would be done with his body and a doctor performing surgery with the prior approval is charged with battery as well as assault and liable in damages taking cue from that the supreme court said that the respondents were guilty of tortious act of negligence and battery and that meant there is a deficiency of service now what was the question of law that was before the court consent was taken that is not disputed consent was rather taken twice first time a consent saying that a diagnostic and operative laparoscopy laparotomy may be required was given and thereafter a consent for abdominal hysterectomy was taken when the patient was unconscious so is it a correct way and what would be the degree of consent when we talk about informed consent now we must understand the real consent is a product of british courts whereas informed consent is what is understood in us the basic difference of real consent and informed consent is that real consent revolves around the bare essential information that a patient should be given or patient requires so that he or she can make an informed decision whereas informed consent the onus is heavy on the doctor to inform every nits and bits of the particular procedure or treatment that he is going to give he is liable to tell the patient what is the degree and difficulty of the operation what are the benefits of the operation when the operation would be carried out what would be the final outcome and what uh, side effects of that operation can take place in the form of failure in the form of damages also what would happen if such type type of treatment is not taken and what are the alternatives before the patient this all needs to be discussed in details in informed consent whereas real consent bases itself on two or three things firstly the patient should be competent to consent that is his age should be he should be a major above majority he should be of sound mind can take a decision and as per as the particular procedure or treatment is concerned the broad outline of the treatment needs to be given i would give an example like for a particular a particular say particular this index case one must disclose to the patient that if a hysterectomy and bilateral salpingiophrectomy is done the patient would never be able to be a child however the distant complications like there can be a vesico vaginal fistula or there can be damage to the ureter need not to be disclosed in detail to the patient or an anesthetic complication which is not expected to happen normally need not to be discussed 
so that is the difference between real consent and informed consent therefore indian courts lay stress on valid and real consent rather than going strictly informed consent second is is there any problem in obtaining real consent in india or why should not be an informed consent the supreme court in this particular judgment elaborated in great details why having a consent having an informed consent is not a good idea in india firstly they differentiated the hospitals between government run hospital as well as private clinics and nursing homes the government run hospitals are overburdened with patients that the, their investigating ability the hospital services as well as the patient uh, the medicines available, available with them is bare minimum and rudimentary therefore a question of informed consent does not arise over there. also the patients from the larger sector of india rural sectors of india from, from the every walk of life are generally not very literate they don't understand what is good for their body and what modality of treatment what alternate modality of treatments they can offer so therefore giving a informed consent in a government hospital does not have much practical so it would be better that a real consent is given the focus in this case was on private practitioners rather than the government hospitals court did say that there are many doctors who without expecting much consideration give their best for the patient however they also observed that not all doctors are paragons of humanity there are hospitals there is a common belief among people amongst people that hospitals unnecessary do treatments provide augmented bills to charge from the patient to make good business so that also a uh, aspect that cannot be unseen or that cannot be oversight now the question arises that can a scope of consent be extended we must understand the consent is actually an agreement so moment the scope is changed increased or decreased this is called novation and a novation in a contract rescinds the contract that means the contract becomes null and void so therefore scope of consent cannot be extended however one has to understand that a consent given for a particular procedure or a treatment cannot be extended to include additional or a separate procedure. however common consent can be taken for two or three different procedures third question can consent once given be withdrawn by the patient during performance of the procedure answer is subjective and yes say a patient has consented for mtp just at the beginning of the mtp even at the dilatation stage she has every right to withdraw the consent but once the procedure starts once the procedure is halfway through obviously patient cannot at that time change the consent a liability of the hospital government hospital as per this particular case obviously a different from private nursing home so so long as take type of consent that they are expected to take therefore in the light of the discussion the appeal was allowed an order of ncdrc which has stated which has dismissed the case was set aside it was held that the bill amount that the hospital has charged if paid or partially paid to be returned with an interest per annum and respondents that is prabha manchanda and the hospital is required to pay rupees 25000 with interest of 10% per annum and the cost of the litigation to be paid the court came to this particular judgment with with the fact that although the operation that was done was without consent was done in bona fide with good faith finally the patient probably in a year or so had to undergo such treatment and there was no allegation of bad treatment or bad operation also the fact it was noticed or it has observed by the court that the patient is obviously of an age where further progression of family 
fecundity itself would reduce and the chances of complication would have been more and chances of a conservative treatment also could have been would have taken a different route altogether resulting in difficulties for the patient so therefore a very minimal amount a meager amount of 25000 was charged against the hospital and the doctor now the reasoning for such decision is it was held the right to to be informed is a paramount right and therefore consent only is very very essential to ensure that a particular way a body human body is handled court held that howsoever beneficial the surgery may be whatever be the reason unless it is an emergency a life threatening situation or a situation where discussing in details about an operation may harm the patient psyche the operation has to be or the treatment of the patient has to be within the bounds of the consent that is taken as we have discussed it was held beyond doubt that any invasive procedure without con con consent would be an assault and would have to be liable the person conducting that have to be liable to damages the question came what would be the adequate information to a patient as i have discussed earlier adequate information would be something that would help the patient to make a reasoned a considered decision say a person goes to even an opd whenever for a particular fever condition say a oxidating drug like premaquine be given obviously patient must inform that a test of g6pd would be required similarly a person goes to a cardiology for stenting angioplasty it has to be informed uh, informed to them that even the best of stents may get clogged in 3 to 6 months time which may require another cabg so these would be very very informed Uh, information that would be required for the patients to have before taking a decision and also what is the criticality of their illness what would be what type of operation or procedure would be undertaken on them what are the merits and demerits what are the advantages what are the benefits and if the operation or particular treatment is not taken what are the disadvantages that a patient would have and what would be the alternative what type of investigation would be carried out on them? this would would complete the adequate information part of it therefore it is held that patient self sufficiency is right and right to know right to information is paramount so therefore what we take home is the doctor has to secure seek and secure consent a person can only operate or conduct a treatment without consent on two situations firstly if it is an emergency life threatening emergency in which patient is unconscious is and in not in a condition to give consent or if the patient's mental condition is so unsettled or so fragile that even discussion about such things may cause severe damage in such cases doctor need not to ask for a consent however there are always scopes for proxy consents consent uh, by authorized persons in case of mentally ill or minors those avenues has to be explored when consent is given certain witnesses maybe third party must be there to ratify the same it has to be taken understood that consent given for only diagnostic procedure cannot be considered for a therapeutic or operative treatment however as i said two types of consent may be combined ab initio and such consent may be taken also if the surgery has to be extended beyond the scope of the consent it has to be documented appropriately and if there is a scope that this can be done later on it is better such operations not be performed in this particular case that we are discussing the patient could have been allowed to recover for anesthesia and an operation a radical operation could have been performed later on 
So there was the lacunae which was exploited by the patient and the disease. Nature and extent of information of consent need not to be stringent. However, it should be obviously to the extent that it enables a patient in by all means by giving him adequate information so that he can take a decision and such information should be to that nature that medical men skilled and experienced similarly would accept this as a valid concept. And obviously, it would always be a good practice to refer the expert uh, before uh, doing so or when uh, the such issues arise to mitigate any untoward or bad outcome of both case. So should there be any question, I'd be ready to take. Sir, uh, <clears throat> I have a small query, sir. sir uh, this is pertaining to the plea being said that uh, the government set up hospitals being too much burdened. They should, uh, the rules being applied that it should be only be applicable to a uh, private setup vis a vis a government setup, wherein consent and you know medical negligence issues may, uh, as per your statement, the, the court said that you know one can overlook or one should not be you know uh, taking too much of cognizance into it. This cases of 2003, sir, almost two decades have gone by. Don't you feel, sir, that uh, this thing should be relooked as far as if more cases come up down the line, sir? Whether it's yeah. a government setup or it's a private setup? Absolutely. Because think, after all, uh, patient safety is of paramount importance. Absolutely. But I think what you have probably missed out or probably did not get it the way I wanted to express it, that is that the question arose where it should be an informed consent in Indian setup or it should be a real consent. In a real consent, adequate information, bare minimal adequate information is to be shared with the patient. Whereas in an informed consent, all information is required to be shared with the patient. Now, if the patient is not literacy wise poor, even if the options of various other expensive surgery operations or investigations given to them, they will not be in a position to undertake them. Taking all this in, is in, uh, into consideration, the Supreme Court said in Indian setup, a real consent would be more applicable rather than having an informed consent. Now, the question is that the basic uh, uh, information has to be provided to the patient. Information to that extent. At, as it would be adequate for him to understand the risks involved if he undertakes that uh, particular operation or procedure. Even if a case of chemotherapy is, is started uh, for a patient, his consent has to be obtained even though there is no invasive procedure is taken. So I think patient uh, uh, safety is not compromised by this one. One, Dr. Subramanian, here. can I ask? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, so I have four comments. Uh, I had gone through the case myself the, in detail, the Supreme Court judgment. So first point I want to ask you your learned opinion, sir, is uh, many operations uh, uh, have a lot of possibilities of various complications uh, which have to be informed beforehand to the patient in the consent document. And while informing uh, the patient about the possible complications, also the likely remedial measures have also to be enlisted in the consent document so that the patient gets a clear understanding of the extent of surgical procedure he is undergoing. Yes, so yes. in that, in that uh, there are two types of sequelae which are usually seen. Uh, one, the complications may have to be dealt with intraoperatively itself by various uh, subsidiary operations. Yes. That is called intraoperative remedial measure, and some of them may require postoperative remedial measure. Like it depends on the time course of the complications concerned. Correct. Now, in 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 such a case, when like for example in neurosurgery we do spine surgery on the cervical spine, we say that the esophagus may get damaged or the recurrent laryngeal nerve may get damaged, or the blood vessels may get damaged. So. Uh, <clears throat> In the case of a recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, it will be visible only after the operation. So it may involve ENT 
consultation and ENT therapy postoperatively. That is a postoperative remedial measure which has been mentioned in the consent document. But in esophagus damage, which has been recognized during surgery, may require emergency intervention uh, by the gastro surgeon, which may be called into the theater to repair a rent in the esophagus. So, uh, in that way, uh, I just wanted to know uh, because these procedures, the gastro surgeon doesn't come in the picture between the patient and the neurosurgeon, but because the remedial action involves a gastro surgeon possibility, uh, it is always a good idea to mention the consent document. Though that doesn't exist a patient doctor relationship by the gastro surgeon, but he has been called in an emergency in such a case. Yes. So I just wanted your opinion on that. Then second, uh, I need your opinion on, suppose if we have this uh, clause called surrogate consent. Like for example, a patient is under anesthesia. The patient, yes. can he have give a legal right to one of his kith and kin, especially the spouse, to consent on his behalf for an eventuality that may occur during operation in which a decision has to be taken. Yes. So can can the consent document have a line incorporated that I authorize my spouse so and so to consent on my behalf in case an eventuality arises while I am under anesthesia during surgery? Is this legally valid? Then, okay. Yeah. Yeah, if I can one by one, otherwise I'll miss yeah. Yes. Uh, first question, uh, when you say that uh, if an additional specialist cover would be required or not, they can all be mentioned in the, con in the consent form itself. Now, obviously, this would vary from case to case. And uh, such person need not to have a direct uh, doctor-patient relationship to begin with. However, certain clauses that any other additional procedure, if envisaged, can be taken for my benefit or words to that effect can be included in the consent form and therefore he can he or she can be adequately informed that we are that this is the percentage of recurrent laryngeal damage in such an operation or this is the percentage of operation uh, people that has suffered from a perforated esophagus and this was the corrective surgery done for them and that can be adequately just mentioned in the consent i would just limit myself today in today's discussion as you have also heard that if what we are discussing here, if I have taken consent only for a diagnostic and a operative laparoscopy, that cannot be extended to a particular operation which is totally different from the, con from the consent for operation or procedure that has been taken. That is my first thing. Uh, second question, if I can just have uh, another uh, uh, kind of refresher. Yeah, the second question is uh, like... Uh, the patient is authorizing his or her yes. surrogate, uh, yeah. surrogate uh, uh, consent. Yes, that's ab obviously that can be easily be done. There is no problem in having a surrogate if his prior authorized. Then of course, uh, a surrogate uh, consent stands valid. But say I have taken a consent for total abdominal hysterectomy with self injury And there is a complication that has taken place. I have taken a consent for caesarean section. I didn't realize there is a placenta accreta and the uterus has got inverted. I had to do a hysterectomy. That is fine. In such case, surrogate consen uh, consents are holds good. But I cannot, while doing an operation, I find something else. There was a very important case. Uh, we didn't discuss it today. Uh, again, very old case of Murray versus McMurray. In this is a very, very uh, well-known case in which what has happened was the patient came for operation, uh, came for Tell you a particular operation for fibroid. But the doctor, when operating, realized there are multiple fibroids in the uterus. Uterus is full of fibroids. So they finally performed hysterectomy. Please understand if it is a fibroid, and if fibroid, there are so many fibroids, it's better the patient has to uh, do a hysterectomy, has to be done on a patient. It is better that the patient becomes conscious, a fresh consent is taken, and that has been done. It's a totally different operation not in the you know, extension of other particular operation. Therefore, in such cases, extension of an operation can be foretold to them. And obviously, there would be a surrogacy, surrogate consent. But if it's a totally different operation, and unless it's a life-threatening condition, uh, then I think it is better that you take a fresh consent. Yeah, thank you, sir. Then one, two more comments, sir. Uh, uh, in cases of surgeries on minor, obviously, yeah. the consent is provided by the... <clears throat> legal guardian or the parent. Yes. So 
during these operations any eventuality happens uh, they are informed during surgery uh, while the minor is under anesthesia yes it holds it holds water isn't it i mean absolutely I absolutely there's no please understand you are, have, are facing it every day no doctor can guarantee cure as i keep saying but the question is any complication even the smallest of procedure can be fraught with complications and here the patient being incompetent to contract he or her or he or she giving consent does not arise so it is the parents or the legal guardian they would be given the consent and they would be competent to you know have ad give additional consent one last comment sir because this case we had studied thoroughly again and again uh, as you had rightly mentioned that uh, out of nowhere a another uh, member of the patient's family came and decided upon not giving the fees and getting discharged yeah. so to circumvent this issue we have uh, brought in what is called a caregiver consent in in today's scenario when the patient is admitted especially for major surgeries or complicated surgeries or procedures we take a consent that these are the people who the doctor is authorized to talk to and nobody else other than this so that uh, has to be clearly mentioned as a part of a caregiver consent where the patient decides these are the people whom the doctor will uh, confide with during the procedure uh, and uh, later on any complication arise they cannot actually bring the counselor or uncles or aunts because they have already consented the doctor will only talk to this particular it is just a suggestion may not be part of the main talk you have given but uh, this additional procedure also will safeguard our doctors yeah actually dr subramaniam at this stage i would not fully go with you because if a consent can be against uh, the public law i you cannot have a contract with me stating that i cannot go to a lawyer that is uh, not a, a, a valid co contract or consent i understand hospitals do face very difficult situations but if such situation actually arises they would supersede the contract they would supersede the consent that they have given they would do whatever they feel like but obviously you have a remedy to ask for a, you can challenge that in court of law so long as you have remained within the consent even a normal operation that has gone wrong there is no negligence in that that does not violate the consent but in this particular case as you have also correctly pointed out that a consent was violated so long as consent is not violated some other party you the opposite party is not uh, honoring the consent it they, that can be they can be taken to the court there is no problem yeah thank you sir thanks any more questions please okay so it looks there are no more questions so kanal ashish thank you very much it was an enlightening talk we have heard about this case again and again on multiple forums and yet every time you discuss this you do discover something new so to me also personally it benefited i am sure everyone else also benefited in a similar manner thank you very much we come again with the third edition of the this learnings from medico legal cases two weeks later we will be announcing the date and the topic separately and all those people who are registered on this program will obviously get a message and a email thank you very much and kan ashish thank you very much uh, thank you sir uh, very well presented i think the, the discussion has taken place uh, and uh, questions also some uh, dr subramaniam has asked, asked some pertinent questions absolutely so that's what uh, dr bhaskar jyoti kalita has a question i think let me uh, let me yes yes i think ha uh, in the chat box there is ah uh, there is something in the chat box so what about the timing for consent okay uh, so uh, any anything you want to add on this what about the timing of the consent it's before the procedure sir before the procedure means ahead of the procedure there has to be uh, i mean it should not be at the 11th hour okay so dr kalita i hope your query is answered the consent has to be taken prior to the procedure yes uh, even in emergency prior means that you take the consent just before the surgery if the patient has landed up in the emergency department otherwise you can take consent whenever you are counseling the patient telling him about the treatment options and procedures 
yes yes and so, it is always better that uh, the team which is operating or doing the treatment gets the consent signed yes this in fact is also a mandatory nabh requirement and also the jci and quas requirements yes. so thank you very much i think we are we have completed today's session and uh, it's great having all of you on this program uh, dr makesh sir very nice uh, nice to see you on the program uh, and uh, we meet again two weeks later the topic and the uh, the uh, date of course will be announced the time remains same it will be on sunday and at 4 pm in the afternoon thank you very much and all the thank best you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So I am closing this meeting for everyone. Yeah.